Okay, well, I'm going to get started here. Uh, my name is Wendy Offers, and I am here in the Okotoks Library in the Foothills. And um, I'm going to host tonight's session for our uh, speaker series, Series Footprint on the Landscape. Um, those of you that haven't joined us before, it's a partnership between a number of RISE libraries and the Government of Alberta uh, in bringing you um, a variety of speakers from across Alberta, as well as tonight, Ryan Spencer from California State Parks. And I'm just going to give you a brief introduction uh, about Ryan's talk. Uh, we've had a variety of uh, information go out about his talk. Uh, but actually what he's going to talk about tonight is pretty similar to the advertising you saw with a slight twist. Um, Ryan is a California State Parks Ports Interpreter and uh, he's going to um, talk to us tonight about how California State Parks uh, has taken um, uh, the new frontier of parks protection. So how they've blazed a trail in um, covering their tracks and doing some restoration in, in the parks he's going to speak about tonight, uh, the Del Norte Coast and the Prairie Creek Redwoods State Park, and things that they've done to restore salmon habitat and other ecosystems, etc. Um, when we spoke to Ryan earlier, he, I think you guys will really connect across Alberta around some of the things you talk about, about indicator species, species at risk, some of the landscape and land use issues that we're talking about through our uh, land use framework and other ways in which we manage the landscape. So um, Ryan, take it away. We're really keen and looking forward to your presentation. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Wendy, for the opportunity. This is um, really a great privilege to be able to to talk to all of you and um, I, again I'll just introduce myself my name is Ryan Spencer and I work for California State Parks and the ports program is the Parks Online Resources for teacher, Teachers and Students program and it's a um, it's an interactive video conference program we talk to individual classrooms um, and uh, interact with students and, and um, I do a program on redwood ecology as well as salmon life cycle and uh, we talk to students all over California and in other states as well as other countries. Um, but this is the first time I've gotten to video conference with, um, with Canada. So I'm really, really happy to be able to join you all today. Now, uh, I should mention to you where I'm located first. Um, um, actually, before I do that, before I do that, since I can see everyone here, can I get a show of hands? Um, how many of you have ever been to California before? Okay, so it looks like almost everyone has. All right, so now for those of you who've been to California, how many of you have been to the Redwood Forest before? Okay, so a little less. Okay, but uh, and then there's some very em emph emphatic uh, yeses as well. So probably some people have been um, uh, really impressed upon by some of the, the, the forests that they've seen. And so that's what I'll be talking about today is the Redwood Forest. Ryan, um, this is Sarah to... in, um, in Pincher Creek. I just I want to interrupt you for a second here. Um, just to send a message to John at headquarters. Can you ensure that Ryan's presentation is viewed full screen in all the in all the libraries, please? We're having trouble getting ours in a full screen mode. Thanks. Sorry, Ryan. Good to know. <laughs> That'll be otherwise I might be pointing to something off screen. So hopefully you're able to see it all. Um, so uh, these parks um, that I'll be talking about are all Redwood State Parks. Um, in our redwood region so i thought i'd really quickly go to a map or, and uh, just show you where i'm located in relation to where you are so let me just zoom out of here real quick and i have calgary set up right here i know not all of you are in calgary but um you get the general idea so here you guys are um in the vicinity of calgary some of you are much farther away from that but this is a way to just figure out where i am located to all of you so we'll zoom out here so i am located in northern california in humboldt county right here and i'll get back to my regular programming and that is where the north coast redwood district is located and that's where i work for so that's a region of our state parks and um they are mostly redwood state parks um, one of the very popular ones is humboldt redwoods state park which is our largest remaining 
Um, it's our largest redwood state park, and it has our largest remaining old-growth redwood forest. But um, this region extends up into the next county as well, from Humboldt County all the way up to Del Norte County, and you kind of get a lay of the land here. Low hills, um, a lot of rivers, and a lot of greenery. And this is kind of the extent of um, our northern redwoods, but um, redwoods are in a lot of areas. We'll talk about some of the areas where they grow, but um, for a lot of people who haven't visited redwood forests, it can be difficult to, to really um, describe them or to really understand what it is like to experience a redwood forest. And I found in putting this presentation kind of a difficulty as well for myself growing up in the redwood forest my entire life, um, being born uh, in the redwood region and and then just some of the simple things that I, I forget to make comparisons to. And one of the things I, I found is the best way to compare a redwood forest is really to our own bodies. And uh, it may be, um, seem like a simple comparison to make, but the redwood forest, just like our bodies, is much more than what we see on the outside. So the redwood forest is made up of many interconnecting parts, just like our bodies have our external side, but we also have our organs, and we have the fluids that we take in, and the nutrients we take in. The redwood forest has these external components as well, and uh, many different parts that are working inside to make this forest whole. So I thought first I'd do a little comparisons to how the redwood forest is like a body, um, like our own, and then we'll talk a little bit about what could be wrong, what could be going on here. So our redwood forests, first of all, um, have a shape, have, a, uh, have some needs. So just like um, we have particular needs for our survival, whether it's simple things like food, water, clothing, things like that. Well, our redwood forests, this entity also um, has particular needs. One of the biggest needs for redwoods is a tremendous amount of rainfall as well as certain kinds of soil and certain kinds of geological conditions, but really climate um, and access to water is really important. So that's why we find redwoods where we do, which is in the coasts of Northern California. So we find them as far south as about Santa Cruz here, and they push all the way up into Southern Oregon, just a little bit beyond the border. And they're in a very narrow belt. So they're only within probably about uh, 40 or 50 kilometers of the ocean at any time. So they really don't grow very far from the coast. And a lot of that has to do with the amount of rainfall that they depend on. Redwoods grow in the rainiest areas of California. And some of our parks get upward to 200 or even more centimeters of rain a year. But one thing you'll notice that's pretty different, probably from where you all are, is, is the, when our rainfall occurs. Our rainfall occurs in the winter time. That is our rainy season. So you've seen December and January, February, March, those tend to be our rainiest times of year. Notice though, in April all the way to August, even September, it's pretty dry. We don't really have a, a winter like um, obviously you all have up in Alberta. We have a pretty mild winter and really we just call it more of the rainy season. So we have really two seasons, rainy season, dry season. And so that's gonna put challenges on redwoods already. These redwood trees are gonna really need year round moisture. And this is why they only live on the coast. Because even in the summertime, there's another moisture source on the coast, and that's our summer fog. So contrary to popular belief, a lot of our um, coastlines here in California are actually not super sunny in the summertime. They're actually quite foggy. We even have a name up here. We call it the June gloom. And that's because they can be very, very dreary. Sometimes our summers are more dreary than our winters. We have better sunny, warmer days in the winter time at times. And uh, though this can kind of maybe sadden the hearts of a lot of us here in the redwoods, it can also, it's actually really beneficial for these redwood trees. They, this will account for about 50% of the, of the moisture that these trees need. All right, so we've talked about um, how, the, like the redwood forest, um, uh, we have needs, the redwood forest have needs, now let's get a little deeper down. Talk about the frame, the skeleton of our redwood forest. Just like we have uh, uh, a skeleton, we have a foundation to our bodies, the redwood forests have a foundation, something that holds this thing together. And that would be geology. Now the geology of our redwood forest region is pretty interesting. You try to imagine, this is the 
continent, of the, the continental plate of North America. And this here is the, the ocean plate, the Gorda plate. And it is sinking beneath the continental plate. And as it's sinking beneath, it's scraping up all kinds of seafloor and all kinds of loose rock and, and sediment and even uh, old shells and things like that that are all piling up. And this, over a long period of time, gets uplifted. And that is what makes up our coastal mountains. And this means that our mountains are very, very erosive. So they're very loose. They're pretty steep, low hills. This right here is Humboldt Redwood State Park. It's just, uh, just one area of Humboldt Redwood State Park where a massive landslide occurred um, many, many years ago. But even still, we're trying to work to prevent this landslide from getting worse by planting trees here. And uh, it's still kind of an active slide, slowly moving. And that's uh, just one example of how erosive our landscape is. This is one of the most erosive regions in the entire world. This right here, sediment coming off of the Eel River. That is just sediment from lots of rain. You can see it, it's visible from space. So we talked about the bones, the geology, the, the kind of the framework that these redwood forests grow on, but we also want to talk about the arteries. So similar to our own body, these these redwood, this redwood ecosystem has a bloodstream. And of course, you could probably all imagine that would be the rivers and streams that are part of this forest. The Eel River is a prominent one um, where we're located here. The Eel River is um, pretty mild in the summertime. People like to go swimming here. It is the, the third largest river in California, and it um, drains a pretty big area. The redwoods are mainly going to be growing along the south fork of the Eel River, where it's a little closer to the coast. But the fog can make its way up pretty far up this river, and so that's going to be very important. Now, in the wintertime, this river can be quite wild, especially when this year, for example, where we have a lot of rain. This river can start um, pushing out quite a bit of water. Another important artery in our Redwood region is the Klamath River. The Klamath River is our second largest river in California, and it drains even some areas of Oregon, um, especially Crater Lake is one of the headwaters for that. Um, and we find uh, Redwood National Park and Prairie Creek Redwood State Park are kind of near here. Another major artery is the Smith River, which is on the northern end of our Redwood region. And this is one of the cleanest rivers in the United States. And it's the only major river in California that has no dam as well. And there are other streams that are going to be very important for these redwoods as well. And the thing about this environment is that there's a lot of flooding that can occur. And that flood water will move its way into a lot of the lower regions of these, of these forests, especially the, the river benches, like right here. And this flood water is going to give a lot of nutrients that these forests need. And so some of our tallest redwoods grow right along the banks of those rivers. So we've talked about the, the structure of our forest. We've talked about the, the bones and the arteries. But we also need to talk about the organs. So just like we have these interconnected network of organs that are helping us function, this redwood forest has the same thing. I guess we could say it's the living things, the living things that make up this forest. The plant life could be an example. You might consider the plants down here and the redwoods themselves as well, kind of the lungs providing that oxygen. Um, but they're also a huge nutrient supply as well. You notice the plants down here are pretty low to the ground. The redwood forests are a very dark environment, so they cast a pretty dark shadow on the world below. Only certain kinds of plants are adapted to live in this kind of dark environment, and they do pretty well. So if the redwood trees in this area were cut down, you probably wouldn't find some of these same plants living here. But let's talk about some of the larger uh, uh, organisms here, including the Roosevelt elk is one animal that's pretty pretty um, iconic in our northern redwood forests. This animal was almost um, completely extirpated from California and needed the help of some herds members up in Washington and Oregon to be reintroduced here. And this animal can get um, up to a thousand pounds, so it can be a pretty heavy animal. And um, you could say that the animals, like the Roosevelt elk, as well as the Humboldt Martin here, which is a very rare animal, only living in our ancient redwood forests. You could say that these animals are kind of 
maybe the fat or the calories or the energy source that kind of moves through this forest. They are basically how nutrients move through this ecosystem. And all of these creatures are also going to contribute to the, the foundation of this forest when they die and decompose. And that's with the help of the digestive system of our redwood forest, including this very important member, the banana slug. And the banana slug is an animal that will eat just about anything here. It'll eat living things, dead things, animal scat. It'll eat uh, animal parts. It'll even try to eat your hand if you let it crawl up your hand. It won't have any luck, but you'll feel it kind of rasping against your skin. One thing they won't eat are the redwoods. So they leave those redwood leaves, redwood needles, as well as the redwood seeds alone. But they're not alone in this digestive process. There's many other, including the worms and beetles and small invertebrates that are breaking down dead material. More important, as far as converting dead things into new nutrients, would be fungi. And fungi have a very important connection with the, uh, the redwood trees themselves. So these um, fungi are creating a network, an underground network of mycelium that is basically transferring water transferring nutrients from tree to tree, and also helping to take the dead material and chemically change them to unlock uh, the nutrients that these trees can use. So some of these comparisons to the redwood forest are kind of, uh, the comparisons of the redwood forest to our bodies can be kind of loose. Um, so some of them are a little hard because, partly because the redwood forest is this giant entity compared to us. But um, you probably kind of get the idea. Another way though, that these redwood forests are like our bodies is that sometimes we're doing well and sometimes we're not doing so well. So think about a time when you have been sick and maybe being at winter time, it might not be that long ago. Maybe it was a sinus infection or maybe it was bronchitis or pneumonia. And usually a sickness that you've gotten or that I've gotten starts out it's just a small symptom, maybe a scratchy throat or a stuffy nose or a runny nose, something, something just subtle that maybe you can kind of ignore for a little bit. Maybe you're in denial about the sickness. And then there comes a point where you really start to feel it and you have to accept that something's just not quite right. Well, our redwood forests and many ecosystems are the same way. Sometimes on the outside, what we see, we may see a pristine forest that looks untouched, but if you look a little closer you and you just check, you might find that not all is well. Now, when you're sick, you probably go to the doctor at some point. And one of the things the doctor will do is check your vital signs, check your, maybe your pulse, your temperature, your respiration, things like that. Well, in our redwood forest, we can do the same thing. We can check the vital signs to make sure this forest is healthy or to try to identify what might be wrong. So, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to look at three vital signs in this redwood forest. We're going to look at something like um, a particular animal. This uh, bird is the first one we'll be looking at, the marble murelet. The marble murelet will help us basically represent the healthy redwood forest in its ideal state. The next animal we'll look at will be the spotted owl, which will be what really marks the change that humans can have on the redwood forest, the way these forests changed and the way that people would work to try to save these forests. And finally, the coho salmon will represent the, the state of a forest that needs help, that needs some kind of treatment. And this will represent the restoration that unfolded in some of these redwood forests to get them back on the road to recovery. So when we talk about animals and we talk about them being vital signs, we have a word for that. We call them indicator species. And so these three animals will kind of represent our indicator species. They're animals that if, we, if they're doing bad or they're doing well, we can kind of get a sense of how well the rest of the ecosystem is doing. So first we're gonna talk about the marbled murelet that lives in our redwood forests here. And the reason we talk about them is because they have a very particular kind of habitat that they need. They need old growth redwoods. Now, some people don't realize that there are different kinds of redwood forests on the coast here, but we have our old growth, we have our second growth, and of course old growth, as you can imagine, represents the older trees. They're not 
um, haven't been damaged or impacted by human activity. Another way to look at old growth forest is owls. Now wait, I thought we were talking about marbled murelets. Yeah. Well, owls stands for something. Old trees, woody debris, layers, and snags. So these are some of the features that are really, really significant in an old growth forest. So old trees can also mean tall trees as well. So some of our oldest redwoods can live up to 2,000 years. And trees, the longer they live, more likely are going to get taller and more massive. Now we often like to use humans or other things as comparisons to these trees. But you get the idea that this tree is probably relatively old. Redwood trees are the tallest trees in the world. And uh, the, the tallest of the group of trees is located in um, Humboldt Redwood State Park. It has the tallest forest, the most number of tall trees. It's not difficult for a redwood tree to get upward of, of 100 meters tall. But the tallest redwood that we know about is located in Redwood National Park. And that tree is 116 meters tall. So let's compare that to something that might be familiar to you all. And that's the, hopefully you can recognize the skyline of Calgary. Uh, and um, the Calgary Tower, and I hope that I'm correct in this, is 190 meters tall. Well, compared to our redwood, our redwood, 116 meters. So our redwood is a little more than half the height of the Calgary Tower. Not, not bad if you put it on the skyline with the rest of these buildings here. It's a pretty massive tree. And there are many trees that are close to it um, in height as well. So tall trees, old trees, that's one, one feature of an old growth forest. Woody debris is another feature. So notice here in Humble Redwood State Park, we have these massive logs. Redwood forests have some of the most biomass of any forests on the planet. Living and dead material is just piled up and it can take centuries for one of these trees to break down. And while they're standing here, while they're lying here, they're going to be great habitat for all kinds of creatures, denning animals and insects. And on those logs, many plants will be able to use it as a platform for growth as well. And then uh, layers and snags are kind of the last things about this old growth forest. So the forest is made of different layers as well as standing snags. And you can see what a snag looks like up close, these standing dead trees with plants growing on them. Great perches for animals, great habitat. And while these trees are um, living, while they're living the centuries and millennia that they do, they're going to encounter all kinds of weather and all kinds of traumatic events that are going to mark them and scar them and give them the characteristics that a bird like the marbled murelet is going to need. Occasionally, powerful storms will come through here in the summertime. Dry lightning storms very, very seldom will come through and cause fires to break out here. Fires are part of our redwood forest. Now, they're not necessarily good and they're not necessarily bad, but these forests can withstand the damage of fire. So these trees can be hollowed out by them. Uh, the bark of a redwood is very resistant to a lot of damage, but occasionally they will burn out, and this is going to open up new opportunities for animals to, to occupy them. Now, if a redwood tree is very heavily damaged by one of these events, then it might re-sprout and regenerate. Redwoods have a remarkable ability to regenerate from their trunks. There are many buds um, that are sequestered around the base of the trunk that can sprout when, damaged, when the tree is damaged. And uh, this is true all along the base of the tree. Even in the upper parts of the redwood tree that might be uh, struck by lightning or broken by wind, the tree will respond by sprouting a very massive new branch called a reiterated trunk. And this, over the centuries, is how these trees start to develop this complex canopy structure. This is going to be what turns out to be very important habitat for the marbled murelet. So let's get back to the marbled murelet now that we've figured out how um, the old growth forests, um, what, what kind of makes up the old growth forest. The marbled murelet is a bird that was mysterious for a very long time. Loggers out here would see these these uh, potato-shaped birds with little wings 
rocketing through the redwood forest at over 60 miles an hour. They called them fog larks. Didn't know a whole lot about them. And fishermen and other sea watchers out there would be uh, noticing a bird out there in the, in the ocean that uh, would dive down underwater and also looked kind of awkward. And they called it um, Australian bumblebees. That's because of just how big their body is compared to their little wings. But it wouldn't be till later that they realized that these were the same bird. And it would be much later till anyone found out where these birds nested. It wasn't really until people began to climb some of these trees to conduct research that the nest of the marble murelets were found. It turns out that the marble murelets depend on those complex canopy structures of these redwood trees. They need big branches. Marble murelets don't really build much of a nest. They're going to use mostly uh, um, just the leaf litter that piles up on these branches. The marble murelet lays only one egg per season, so it needs a high secluded place that's protected. The redwood tree offers some of the best protection around. The marble murelet is a seabird, and it will fly out many, many miles to get fish for its chick. And these chicks will eat so much fish that they'll actually become larger than mom and dad. So, the, so this, this bird will become larger than mom and dad while it's a chick. Now it'll lose some of that weight eventually, but uh, just imagine one of your own kids being larger than you when they're still a toddler. So this marble murelet is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to this old growth redwoods and this canopy up here. Um, Along this tree and up on these branches, you're going to find all kinds of other things as well. And one of those, because of all these leaves that have accumulated, you might find the soil. It's in there. It's really awesome, rich, organic soil. It holds a lot of water. And some of these big trees, it can hold five to 10,000 liters of water in their soil. So soil has accumulated on the tops of some of these trees, um, or on the branches, or in the open cavities, because of all the leaves that have piled up from the centuries and have broken down. And uh, soil. in all of this soil, uh, you'll find water stored up. Mosses will begin to grow. Ferns will begin to grow. And these things them too, themselves will break down and decompose, and they will make up uh, a new layer of soil, and succession will take hold, and then berry bushes and small trees will also be able to sprout. So these redwood trees have essentially a miniature forest, a miniature ecosystem growing on their branches. You'll find creatures like salamanders up here that can spend their entire lives on the branches of one of these trees and never come to the ground for a thing, because everything they need to survive is up here. So generations of these salamanders Will, will live out on the branches of these trees. And uh, so there are many, many organisms that can thrive on the soil that is developed on these trees. So you can kind of see why our marble murelet might be a good indicator, a good vital sign for our redwood health. Where we find these murelets, the, the, the very demanding conditions that they need and they require, um, that's really gonna tell us that, that the conditions are right for these other organisms and these other complex ecosystems. So then it might disappoint you to know that the marble murelet is not doing all that well. There were once about 60,000 of these birds in California. Today, there are 4,000 left. Clearly, something was wrong. A sickness was coming to this forest. The next vital sign that we want to talk about is one that will help us to understand how this forest changed, to understand how we might have had an impact, and also the ways that people worked to try to overcome some of these changes, to try to protect some of these forests. The, the organism I'll use for this vital sign is the spotted owl. The spotted owl is similar to the marble murelet in a couple of ways. It depends on the old growth redwoods. It depends on those oldest trees. The spotted owl uses the cavities and cracks and things of these complex canopies to make its nest and to, um, to perch as well. The spotted owl depends on the, these 
high, high canopies that they fly under. They need space between these trees, so they need enough room to be able to hunt. And beneath there, they're looking for rodents, such as flying squirrels, and um, additionally, they'll be looking for wood rats and other small creatures. And because they're a kind of a smaller owl, they're, they're actually going to benefit from this dense canopy cover. It'll give them some protection from larger owls and larger predators that they might experience. So this is a bird that, because of its dependence on this old growth redwood forest, would be a bird that would be pretty heavily impacted when people began to make changes in this forest. Now the forest, the redwood forests have been changed and managed by people for millennia. So even before the pyramids were even conceived of, the Yurok tribes and the Wiat tribes and the Hupa and the Karuk and the Talawadani all lived in this region and they managed the forest to some degree. So uh, for example, the Klamath River, that artery we talked about earlier, um, during the salmon migrations, this river would be um, dammed up with a temporary fishnet dam to slow the movement of the salmon so some of these fish could be harvested. Uh, the redwood forest was also used in other ways to build houses like these plank houses that the, that the Yurok tribe would build. But um, even the hillsides and even the prairies, some of the open land was burned by these tribes to make sure um, that land stayed open for game hunting and things like that. So when the first white settlers began to arrive to California, they actually entered a forest that was already heavily managed by people. But the actions that would come next would be very, very different and very, very dramatic. Now, in the early uh, 18 or in the mid 1800s, when people were coming to California looking for gold, the yellow gold. Some people came looking for the red gold, the redwood. The acid and the resins in these trees made a very, very long lasting source of lumber. So things that you built with these trees could stand around for centuries. They don't rot. They don't get uh, insects and pests like other woods do. So people use them for furniture, for decks, and for the sidings of houses. So this became a huge moneymaker. Logging in the redwood forest took off very quickly and technology improved very dramatically from mules and oxen and saws to chainsaws and tractors and helicopters. These redwoods were used for all kinds of reasons, including to help rebuild San Francisco after the devastating 1906 earthquake that leveled most of the city. These trees helped in the war efforts in World War I and World War II. They helped in construction of boats as well as planes. There's many reasons these redwoods were used. And then when the wars were over and people were returning home, veterans were returning, returning home, houses needed to be built, and these redwoods, again, supplied a huge amount of lumber for these houses. But at the same time, all of this logging was having an impact on the forest. A lot of these old growth redwood forests that we talked about started to vanish in the boom of timber. Some people were concerned that all the old growth would disappear. And they said, wait, we need to save some of these trees before they all go away. We need to save just some, just to make sure that the old growth forest doesn't disappear. Now, they formed a group, a couple of, uh, or a handful of citizens formed a group called the Save the Redwoods League. It was made of many wealthy individuals. And other groups were also formed, but the Save the Redwoods League was particularly unique because they are responsible for purchasing about 60% of the protected redwood forest that we have today. So they protected somewhere around 189,000 acres of old growth redwoods. Much of them now are protected in state parks. So Del Norte Coast Redwood State Park, Prairie Creek Redwood State Park, Jedediah Smith, Humboldt Redwoods, Redwood National Park. I could go on and on with the parks that this organization helped to protect. They made sure that we had some forest, some old growth forest left. But they were more focused on protecting trees and groves. And there wasn't a lot of thought back then about protecting ecosystems or animals or habitats. And so for a long time, 
the same kinds of practices that were happening outside the forest continued on. And as we got into the 50s and 60s, people, the demand for lumber got higher, and people got better and better at cutting them down. But in 160 years of redwood logging, um, from the gold rush to today, the old growth redwood forest went from 2 million acres to today, only 4% of that remain. So most of that old growth forest is gone. And more of it possibly would have been gone if it wasn't for the actions of those preservationists that saved some of these trees. But in that time period between the 1950s and today, as those trees began to get cut faster and faster, we want to turn back to the spotted owl because the spotted owl will begin to resurface as a symbol for the conflicts between the industry and environmentalists. And uh, this bird would really become more of a lightning rod. Because over this time period, the, the spotted owl was still on the decline. Clearly, just protecting these parks wasn't enough for this bird. Now, in 1990, the spotted owls were listed as an endangered species. And this led to some pretty major conflicts because the Forest Service, the United States Forest Service that manages a huge amount of our nation's forest land, basically took millions of acres of logging off of production. People couldn't even cut down any of these forests that they used to be able to access. And this made some wonder, maybe the real endangered species were the loggers, and maybe the real endangered species were the mill workers and people that were just trying to make a living. And so more and more conflicts unfolded because some wanted to protect the birds and others just wanted to protect their livelihood. Around the same time as the, uh, the, uh, the owl was listed, another uh, group of concerned environmentalists were mounting what was called the Redwood Summer, a, a big demonstration to, to raise awareness about the protection of some of the last old growth forests that were very quickly being cut down. People like Judy Berry, who spearheaded that, um, would then uh, would also have company in people like Julia Butterfly Hill, who sat for 738 days in one of these old growth trees to protect it from being cut down. So there are many, many people that were involved in what would become called the timber wars, this battle between industry, between people's jobs, and between habitat and ecosystems. The last, the, the kind of end of this of this battle happened when the 7,000 acre headwaters forest, the last remaining unprotected redwood forest, went under protection, was purchased by the federal government. And this really represented uh, kind of the end of the preservation movement because most of the old growth redwood forest was either cut down or protected. And it also marked a pretty big change as well because New practices, the timber industry began to focus more on surveying and monitoring their habitats and making sure that they weren't cutting down um, the old growth. A lot of timber companies changed their practices to where they would protect some of the old growth trees that were left. And of course, in this time period, new trees were continually being grown and people were still cutting down trees. They were just doing it in a more sustainable way to make sure that, um, that they would have continually regenerating forests. So, this kind of messy history, uh, what does it say about that bird, the spotted owl? Well, the spotted owl is not really doing, still not doing that well. The, the events that happened, the loss of habitat, many things have made it very difficult for them uh, to continue on. So sometimes some of the creatures that we hope to help are still going to struggle. But in the end, preservation might be one of our greatest enduring legacies, the preservation of some of these parks, places that we can visit, places that anyone can visit for generation after generation. The scientific discoveries that come out of some of these places um, are also very important. So the story still continues for that bird, the spotted owl, and we hope that it'll continue on and hopefully it'll improve. So preservation. That's, uh, that's it, right? That's the end of the story. We have uh, these forests that are protected and we can visit them now and that's it, right? Not quite. Because 
Just because something's protected doesn't mean it's necessarily safe. Think about a time when perhaps uh, you broke a bone. If any of you have ever broken a bone, I myself have sprained a, a, or have tore a lot of ligaments in my ankle. And you can put a cast or a bandage or something around it, but that's usually not the end of the story. You're going to need treatment. You're going to need physical therapy, possibly surgery. Well, the same thing can be said for some of our parks. Some of these areas that are protected, um, they're contained, but there's going to be some work that needs to be done. And that's what turns us to the next vital sign of our forest, of our redwood forest, the coho salmon. Coho salmon represents the park manager's efforts to try to restore and heal some of these forests that maybe were damaged over time. The coho salmon that we'll talk about live in Mill Creek, the Mill Creek watershed, which is located um, here in the very northern tip of California in Del Norte County. And uh, this park, Del Norte Coast Redwood State Parks, um, it was a relatively small park for a long time. And uh, it was uh, mostly, like a lot of these parks, created to protect old growth redwoods. So this park was made back in 1929, so around the same time that the Save the Redwoods League was, was protecting a lot of those forests. And um, there was a campground that was built in the corner of this park. And so people would camp beside Mill Creek, and um, many people saw this as a nice destination, very relaxing, very secluded. But in the wintertime, when everyone left and the campground closed down, the gate was locked, another mass movement was happening to this particular area. And that was the migration of coho and chinook and salmon. So the largest, one of California's largest coho salmon fisheries is located here in this park. And uh, these salmon would just make through, their way through just a sliver of the park on their way up into the higher watershed where they would spawn. They'd make their nests, like this salmon here, making its, its nest using mostly its tail. And uh, the land that they were spawning in, the watershed, up from about the 1950s on was managed by the Miller Rellum Company. The Miller Rellums had, um, had a sawmill, and they managed over 20,000 acres of old growth forest. And uh, in the next 29 years, from the uh, 1960s to the early 1990s, they would log almost that entire 20,000 acres of old growth redwood forest. And each year, in their highest rate of production, be bringing out milling enough wood to build a small city every single year. And this wood was shipped all over the state, all over the country, all over the world. But it also had a pretty tremendous impact on the salmon habitat here. Now, after 29 years, the Millerellum had exhausted their entire resources. And they had almost no old growth left. And uh, all the trees that they had replanted were so young, they wouldn't be able to cut them for probably another couple decades. And the company folded. The Save the Redwoods League, we talked about earlier, they bought most of this land. And then in 2002, deeded it to California state parks. And so um, state parks were suddenly left in a quandary because parks is usually about protecting more pristine looking land. But this was land that was full of hundreds of miles of roads and most of the forest had been cut down. And so there was all kinds of challenges, but this wasn't something new. This gave the parks an opportunity to make some prescriptions, to maybe um, propose a treatment that could help this ailing forest. And so began a very interesting experiment. Now Mill Creek, as we mentioned, that the salmon used to come back up here to spawn uh, this very important waterway, um, well, it was experiencing some challenges. All these roads were starting to, to fail. So we had landslides that could happen, and that could bring sediment into the streams. And these streams are really important. The gravel here uh, is important for salmon's nests. And so if these, this gravel is covered up by sediment, then that could be a big challenge. So they had to propose some surgery. So the, an example of surgery in our watershed might be something like this, road removal. So the state parks decided to attempt 
some very difficult feat, removing some of the hundreds of miles of roads that were built here. And this is a process that's ongoing. It's going to take a long time for these, these things to happen. But hopefully, after several decades of this work, we'll start to see less landslides and start to see even cleaner water than we have now. Another prescription that had to be made was um, the fact that there wasn't very much habitat for these juvenile salmon. So a lot of the logging had meant there wasn't much wood left in the streams, and wood is very important when these juvenile fish need places to hide. So another thing that our state parks is doing is basically doing what we call in-stream restoration, putting new wood into these creeks. And this is something that not just, uh, not just these um, parks are doing, but timber companies are also doing this on their land as well, because they see the value in a healthy um, salmon fishery as well. And then finally, the last prescription is something to help the salmon from my, to help them in migrating back upstream. And uh, one of the biggest challenges in this watershed was because of the roads that were built here, a lot of them were, a lot of the roads were built over creeks. And this meant that uh, the creeks were put into culverts, um, a little cheaper than building a bridge. But as a result, these culverts that blocked some of these streams also blocked salmon from their original spawning grounds. Some of these fish um, have been cut off for possibly half a century or longer from places that their species or that their um, lineage eventually or originally spawned out of. So again, some in intensive surgery that our park is doing in this watershed, removing some of these culverts to allow for these salmon to gain access back up. Now, this is done in the summertime and uh, when there's not many fish in the stream. You can see it takes a lot of work and uh, a lot of energy. And it, some might wonder, is it worth it? Well, to be able to see these salmon come back up, it's worth it. We'll talk about that in just a second. This right here is the most recent, most recent effort, the removal of a culvert on Hamilton Creek. This happened just this last fall. And just this last fall, up until the time that this culvert was removed, no fish, no salmon had been found here. Once it was done, I went out with a survey crew just several weeks ago, and we found this creek filled with salmon carcasses. And uh, this image here, you'll notice these orange tags, these represent the nests that salmon have built. So hundreds, you know, not just hundreds, thousands and thousands of salmon eggs have been seeded in this stream. So this stream that had been cut off for possibly half a century is now available for salmon to spawn. And that's very important because these salmon are food for our black bears. So we don't have grizzly bears uh, like you all have up there. Um, we have our black bears. And I know that you all have black bears as well, but the difference being our black bears eat fish. So salmon are a big part of their diet, and not just the only animals that depend on them. Um, bald eagles as well, and many other animals. So just by allowing salmon back up into this creek, you're going to also invite many other animals to partake in this big feast. And hopefully they'll bring carcasses up into the, creek, into the watershed, into the hillsides, and they'll break down and they'll fertilize the forest and allow these trees more nutrients. So these salmon will start to feed the entire ecosystem feed all the creatures that live here. So is this successful? Well, it's going to take a lot longer for us to be able to tell for sure. We can see some of the progress that's been happening. Now, we've talked about three vital signs in our redwood forest. We talked about the marble murelet, which is the ideal state. We hope that a, cre uh, a park like Del Norte Coast um, will eventually get to. We talked about the spotted owl as a symbol of change in the redwood forest and a symbol of protection in the redwood forest. And we talked about the spawn or the um, the coho salmon as a sign of restoration, recovery, the road to recovery in our redwood forest. And there are many other things that we can talk about that we could talk about, um, but these I feel like are the most representative of how um, these forests, the different state that these redwood forests can be in. So what's the rest of the story? Some of these actions have been resounding through other parts of our redwood forest. Most of our redwood forest is still managed by timber companies. 
And most of them have picked up on the idea that it's important to make sure that your ecosystem is healthy, to make sure that trees are healthy, they'll grow better. And so a lot of our, a lot of the timber companies around here have started to do some of that same, those same actions to restore and to uh, monitor some of these watersheds and some of the habitat that live here. It's really important to tie this back to our bodies again too, because we did compare these forests to our bodies, to our own health. Just the sheer simple fact of having land protected is important for our health. Uh, not just the fresh air that they produce or the clean water that they help to protect, but also just the ability for us to visit some of these protected areas. It's good for our well-being and good for our mental health. And uh, also, these parks stand as a really good indicator of our ability to exercise restraint, to decide to leave a little something aside, to leave something that our children can see and our children's children can visit. And to, to really see that we can help some of this forest get its way onto the road to recovery. So everyone, I wanna thank you so much for visiting me uh, here at the North Coast Redwoods District in our state parks. And I know that I've taken quite a bit of time talking to you and I haven't got to interact with you all yet. So I wanna know if we could take some time for some questions and um, hopefully maybe you'll have some, some uh, good questions for what we've talked about. So thank you so much again. Hi, Brian, it's Wendy here. Uh, I was riveted from the beginning to the end of your presentation and all the things that you shared. Uh, I was surprised by many of the things that you brought to our attention and I had no idea that redwood forests and the tree itself would regenerate uh, when it's been damaged through uh, sprouting from obviously buds and root systems from the ground and then also the reiteration of branches. So um, I'm gonna invite, I can't see everyone on screen. I can just see you in full. Sarah, can you see everyone in the other libraries or are they still all full screen to you? Um, I just see you. I think John oh, there we go. at headquarters has it set so that the library with the person who's speaking will go on full screen. Oh, okay, because uh, normally at this point we can see all the libraries and we can call on them to see who's still there. So I'm a little blind as to uh, who's still available and connected. Um, I guess the format well, will be... Yeah, I, I see Ryan. everyone on my screen. So, okay, so maybe, uh, Ryan, from your end, you can see if there's audience members at each of the libraries and uh, their name will appear at the bottom of the screen and you can uh, invite them directly to do some Q&A with you. All right, let's, let's see that. Does anyone have any questions or comments or anything about the Redwood Forests or? Let's see, I see. Yes, Mary Gold. Uh, okay, that's probably us at Okotok. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. That would be, okay. oh, that's right, there's more than one marigold, so Okotoks. Uh, yeah, um, I'm interested to know if you uh, re put any animals back into the, the uh, what you've got there to see to reseed animals, so to speak, and I found it particularly interesting that you get the salmon going back into a creek that they hadn't been in. Did you, in fact, release any further upstream, or did they do it naturally? Um, the... So the first question is um, about the re reintroducing some animals. Um, there's been some practices like that. In fact, one of the, the things that the Roosevelt elk that um, I showed you, that was an animal that was reintroduced um, uh, because it had been pretty much uh, hunted out of California in the early 1900s. And that was re reintroduced um, several decades ago. Can't remember exactly when it was brought back in. Um, another, I think a proposal is, a plan is to reintroduce um, California condors back into the Redwood region, which uh, California condors are our largest birds. They have the largest wingspan and they're sort of like a, um, a pretty large, majestic scavenger that, um, that still lives in some areas of California, but it's been very, very... Um, manage because of the fact that it's just on the brink of extinction. So the, this next thing is trying to reintroduce condors 
into these regions, which were really, they used to be very iconic in the redwood forest. Um, so, oh, and then as far as uh, the salmon, the salmon was the other question. Um, these, uh, I, I don't believe that we have um, added any um, salmon species upstream. Um, it's been pretty much on their own just by removing culverts. And fortunately in Mill Creek, there hasn't been any areas where the salmon have just been so extirpated that, we, that they couldn't just recover. There's a lot of controversy about doing that with salmon, um, about um, raising some salmon and, and reintroducing them into parts of the creeks because um, in a lot of our, our creeks and rivers, the salmon are very genetically unique from each other. And um, so the idea is to, if we try to maintain the, the unique genetics of those streams, um, but some, that, that question has come up in some of our rivers nearby, just south of me, um, the Matoll River, which uh, its coho salmon run has been on the brink for the last um, about 20 years. And there's always the question of, should we just try to introduce some salmon back into it, or should we just try to hope that somehow this salmon species maintains? And it hasn't been a, a debate that's been settled yet. Any other questions or anything like that? Ryan, this is um, Medicine Hat. Uh, Excellent, here you go. Okay, and uh, uh, we live in the Shortgrass Prairie, which is about the farthest you can get from uh, the Redwood Forest in terms of ecosystems. Uh, our tallest plants are about uh, a meter high or so, <laughs> most are about <laughs> half a meter. <laughs> and, uh, but some of the problems are still the same as what you've been describing, and perhaps some of the solutions are similar as well. Uh, I'm wondering in particular how you got the, uh, the support to, uh, to undertake this restoration work. Uh, was the support from urban areas or did the people in the rural uh, areas surrounding the state park recognize the value of doing this? Well, um, that, um, that particular park, Del Norte Coast Redwood State Park, um, uh, the, there was a pretty a huge amount of, of um, community involvement and there was a lot of meetings um, stakeholder groups came together and talked about um, some of the different ways um, to to use it. Now that land was purchased, um, it had already been purchased by the Save the Redwoods League and um, then it was given to the state parks so there, there wasn't um, necessarily a, a necessity for that kind of planning because basically the park um, sort of felt an obligation to manage it in a way to help restore salmon. But there was also a sense that there really needed to be some community involvement because especially um, the, the nearby town of Crescent City, um, they are surrounded by public land. And so they don't have a lot of, of um, private land. And, and so there's, there's always a strong concern about, well, more public land here, are we going to be able to enjoy this at all? And so one of the, the, um, the compromises that came about was that um, that, that land, which is still, again, it's just a, a, a chunk of land that's being restored, but it's also open for the public on the weekend. So people can come visit and drive around on the roads and, and even go fishing in, in the creeks. Um, and so um, it's, it's, it definitely required some community involvement to try to get them on board with actually making this park um, uh, something that, that people in the community could also use. So that's, that's definitely um, uh, can be a concern. But it, in the end, the state parks um, do have a natural resource program where they try to restore habitats and restore environments. Um, and sometimes, sometimes uh, some of the organizations like we talked about, um, like, uh, or some of the groups, like um, I didn't mention the Environmental Protection Information Center, but they're a group that is often sued to get for more protection. So um, they would, for example, the Forest Service, they sued the Forest Service, and that led to um, the things like um, the, the, um, the different um, practices, timber practices happening in our state. Um, so yeah, community can get involved in a lot of different ways. And sometimes it's through litigation, sometimes it's through just cooperative meetings. Any other questions? This is Cardston, we have a question. Go ahead, Elaine. Uh, I'm wondering about all the dams on these rivers. You said there was only one river, not dam. Is anyone thinking about taking out some of those uh, those dams? Yeah. So um, the Klamath River, which is that the second largest river in California, 
um, has a um, has a, a series of dams. I can't remember how many. I believe there, there's more than four dams on that. And um, there's been a, a lot of effort to try to get those dams removed. Um, they were put up there um, uh, uh, almost half a century ago, and um, a lot of it was for providing water and, ener and energy um, for farmers up above um, the Klamath River, but it also led to some pretty big challenges below downstream where the salmon fisheries were, were definitely um, uh, imperiled. And there was an event that happened in uh, 2000, 2002, I believe, where the, um, there was a, it was a dry year and water was, was not being, not much water was being released. So there was kind of a, the salmon were needing more water and these dams control that flow and that water was, was being stopped. Um, and there was a huge fish kill. There was something around, um, uh, I can't remember the exact number, I think it was more than 30,000 salmon died because they got a disease because there wasn't enough water. And that has led since to a lot of action to try to get the some of these dams removed and lots of different stakeholder meetings, just like what happened in our, in our park, um, to get them removed. And um, I believe the last um, initiative just kind of collapsed. I think the last thing that I think in, in December when there was supposed to be congressional movement on it and I think it fell apart and so the, the work continues to get some of those dams removed but I think there's just an issue of who's going to do it and uh, the, the, the owners of the dams don't want to be the one to do it or at least they don't want to be liable for it. So um, yeah there's a, there's, there's a lot of complications. As far as the other rivers, the Eel River which is where our largest Redwood State Park is located. Um, that dam is way, way upstream. It's, um, it's, and it doesn't probably have a chance anytime soon of being um, removed. It, um, part of it, does, there's, there are two dams on it. One of them doesn't really stop salmon too much. Um, the other one farther upstream does a little bit, but those dams, um, they actually, water is taken out of there and taken down south to um, uh, kind of to the Napa Valley area. So wine country, if you probably are all familiar with wine country. So a lot of that water ends up going down into wine country and that water is probably not going to be um, uh, stopped going there either. So, so there's, uh, other than the Klamath River, I don't think there's much um, movement on removing some of the other dams. Um, and, and it's a, I should mention that those are major rivers. So there are some minor rivers, small rivers that, that don't have dams on them in California. But um, a lot of our rivers are more like what you guys would probably call creeks. Um, so even some of our bigger rivers are probably only the size of a pretty small stream or creek in, in especially some of the areas of, of Canada, especially along um, the Rockies there. Um, other questions? We have another question from Cardston. Well, since you've um, improved all these things and you've taught people about the Redwood Forest, are people taking an interest in this and trying to do what you say and to make the forest better and, and to preserve it? Um, yeah, I, it's, you know, it's, it's interesting. It's an interesting time that I feel like I live in when I, came, when I kind of started working in the Redwoods because... Um, uh, my dad, for example, worked. He was a. My dad worked at a sawmill in um, uh, in uh, Humboldt County here, and uh, and he kind of saw it from the other side, where he he saw um, the timber companies starting to close down and some of the challenges. And so I kind of grew up from hearing this sort of adversarial relationship between environmentalists and and the companies and industry. But the time now, most people are on board. Most people agree that, um, that we want to make sure that our forests are healthy. And our, the logging company, the largest timber company up here, um, uh, is uh, one that, um, that has vowed to not cut down any old growth redwoods and that has, um, has some pretty good salmon management programs and, and monitoring and, and, and hires their own um, scientists and and surveyors and so um, there's there's still a little bit of controversy but not much and and people are all kind of on on board with the idea of trying to protect them 
As far as new state parks or new preser pre preserves, um, that's uh, probably not going to be so much what happens just because almost all of the old growth redwoods are protected. So everything that's being cut down are second or third or fourth generation redwoods that have just been um, in private ownership for a long time. Um, but uh, people love the redwood forests and we have, I think, um, I don't know the exact numbers, but we've had every year it seems like more and more visitors to these parks. And um, for example, usually we would have a summer season of visiting and then we'd have a winter season where it would really slow down. Well, last winter it didn't slow down. It just kept, people just kept visiting, kept camping, kept coming to the forest. So um, we're getting we're getting a huge increase in, in visitation than we had um, kind of earlier on when we were in economic recession. So people are really coming back to visit these parks. And we see people from all over the world too that are really um, jazzed about the redwood forest. People um, come from, from all walks of life to see them. Any other questions? Um, leave uh, another one here for Yeah, I, I'm curious, Ed, when you talked about the last park there that uh, was given, and have you got, I presume you must have an overall plan to um, rewild that, I guess, for lack of a better word, um, an overall plan to, and uh, what's the time frame on that? If these things can live for 2,000 years, you're talking a long time, are you not? <laughs> Right, right. It's it's pretty amazing the time scale. Trying to imagine um, what the plan is for then. I think um, you know, there's a very detailed plan about what to do, but it's I believe it's within the, the just sort of the next 30 years of what we're going to do. And um, some of these plans um, are I, I'm not sure what the availability is between countries, but some of these management plans they're they're public information anyone can access them. I don't know how again how easily they're accessible from other um, uh, between Canada and the United States, but um, they're, um, and I'm not an expert on them either, uh, but uh, it, it seems like the biggest step is um, removing those roads and uh, planting new trees on those kind of impacted areas. But also another one that was a little more controversial was um, a, lot of, uh, a lot of these areas that are being restored um, were actually cutting down some trees too, and that's because a lot of um, the watersheds were aerial seeded, so planes would fly over, and fly over and drop just thousands of seeds. And so you'll have what are called dog hair stands of, there'll be 30 year old redwood trees, but they're all about that thick and they're all growing within feet of each other. So you'll, you'll kind of just be walking through this very tight stand of very thin, but very old, uh, relatively old trees. and um, so just to compare it, usually redwood forest, an old growth redwood forest has about 25 or 30 trees per acre. These dog hair stands have about 2,000 trees per acre. So cutting down trees is one thing them, that they're trying to do to, to encourage these trees, the bigger ones, to get bigger faster. Um, another proposal that some scientists um, in the, our nearby university, Humboldt State University, um, they're proposing is trying to actually um, create some of the old growth characteristics in these younger trees. I mentioned those trunks, those complex crowns where the trunks kind of sprout back from the base of the tree or even from the top of the tree, a new big branch kind of sprouts off. So one of the proposals is to try to see if, um, to find a tree and try um, knocking down a tree and kind of aiming it just to damage another tree and to see if you can you can um, maybe synthesize some of that kind of um, create uh, the tree to respond if, it, if a tree falls and scrapes against another tree the hope is maybe it'll cause one of those big um, branches to sprout and so that's another experiment that some um, that they're that I believe the university is trying in some very particular plots I don't think that's being done in any pristine areas yet but um, they're just toying around with the idea of trying how can we how can we make it to where these young forests might develop old growth characteristics sooner so um, again I'm not an expert on that um, either but uh, that's just things I've been hearing around um, and been reading a little bit about um, in my time here 
Very expensive to do that, though. Isn't that very time? <laughs> yeah, well, fortunately, that's the that's the university that will be taking care of that. So, um, and uh, but yeah, definitely managing these forests is um, it can be very expensive, and um, it it seems like um, we're always kind of on a on a shoestring budget anyway. So sometimes these are just dreams that we'll you know hope one day if we if we um, somehow get a a windfall of revenue that we'll be able to do but for the most part um and it's also i should mention that it is part of our state mandate too it's part of our mission um when our the state park system was created our job was to protect um was to protect these um unique environments but also um to to provide for the enjoyment of people so we have this kind of dual mandate like a lot of parks do which is to to protect and preserve the integrity of these ecosystems but also to provide um, visitor enjoyment, and so um, there's times where um, where those those two things can can be kind of costly. Any other questions or comments or remarks or thoughts? Hey, it's uh, Winnie here. Oh, do you have another one? No, I'm just, yeah, I'm just looking around. Okay. Um, let's wait here. If we have no further questions for Ryan, um, I just want to make sure our audience knows that this presentation will be available on the RISE Network YouTube channel at some point. We can't, we're not sure on the timeline. But I just want to thank Ryan for his great presentation and his visuals of bringing us the Redwoods from California. Uh, again, I thought it was a really fascinating, intriguing presentation. You're just a wealth of knowledge. I was surprised by many of the facts and information. And um, I hope that we can join you again in the future, Ryan, and that you can bring us other interesting topics that, from the Redwood Forest and the work that you do. And perhaps some of your other colleagues in California State Parks would be willing to bring us a, a presentation that they're enthusiastic in sharing with us here in Alberta. So I want to wish you a great evening and thanks again. And thanks again to our audiences across Alberta for joining us tonight. So we'll see you Thank soon. Thank you so much. It was okay. a great opportunity. I really enjoyed it. Thank you, everybody. Have a great night. Hopefully I'll come back again soon. Bye, everyone. Goodbye. Bye.